to say welcome. I'm Pastor Josh, and glad to have those of you joining us online as well. And that's exactly right to adore our Lord this morning. And that's one thing you can expect. We're here, we're gathered in the name of Jesus, and we, we are going to sing some songs to him because we love him and he's worthy of that. We're going to read the scriptures because this is God's instruction and guide us for us. And we're going to have time to connect with one another and care for each other and to pray for one another. And that's some of what you can expect this morning. We also have a giving basket in the back, and you can give online as well. And we encourage you to do that as the Lord leads you. And this morning, uh, we're going to be reading from the book of Matthew. So please follow with me. Matthew 5, chapter, uh, verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. God, we do gather this morning and declare that you are holy, that you are good. Lord, we adore we, you, we worship you, we praise you. We give you our hearts, Lord, that you might do something fresh and beautiful in us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you just waiting in it you know what I mean how are everybody <laughs> it is really good to see you if you don't mind just 
as you find your way to your seat, you could maybe, hang on, you could maybe spin and smile to the people around you. So, if you have access to the scriptures, to a Bible, you might want to grab that now because even as Pastor Josh mentioned, one of the, the values that we hold here is the reality of God's word, um, not only for us, but in us, through us, and around us. So, if you don't mind, you can turn to the book of Matthew chapter 5, and maybe you've been tracking along as we've been going through the story of Jesus as it's communicated to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're doing our best to do what, we would, be, what would be called a chronological study in the life of Christ, right? And what that means is we, we kind of do our best to put these events in order. But if you were tracking along last week, you notice we were in Matthew chapter 12, and we've backed up to Matthew chapter 5. It's just worth noting, good Bible study knowledge, things to remember. When the gospel writers were writing, Matthew, Mark, who was most likely writing Peter's story, Luke, uh, John, when they put their perspective of the life of Christ down on a parchment or a scroll or whatever it is that they used, they were most concerned with themes more than chronology, more than order. So they arranged the events in such a way as to communicate the whole of what they were doing. Matthew, again, as I mentioned last week, writing to a Jewish audience, arranges the events in the life of Christ in such a way that his point to the Jews would be taken or at least understood based on the way he organizes it. Just so you know, that's why sometimes... Uh, one gospel writer will have an event here, and another gospel writer will have an event here. And if you compare them, sometimes things get rearranged a little bit. There's no issues. They're just writing more thematically than they are chronologically, which explains, by the way, I can't help it. You know what I mean? I just love Bible study. <laughs> and I just love little Bible tidbits that maybe can help us in our own walk with Jesus especially in the midst of a world that's trying to tell us or trying to convince the church that it's old-fashioned and God's word isn't worthy anymore of our attention, and yet nothing could be further from the truth. Yes and amen. So it's good to know, like we can go when somebody goes, well, why, are the, why is it just such a, you know, why does this person and this person and there's conflict? It's good to know, well, hold on, like whether you understand it or not, at least I know that in the ancient Near East, they were concerned more with the theme and uh, getting their message across than the order. So they move them around. So hence, we're in Matthew chapter 5. And if you're paying attention, even more exciting than Matthew chapter 5 in terms of we're looking at it after we had already looked at chapter 12 and what are we going to do with everything in the middle? Well, we've got plenty of time and we'll get there. On the Mount, the most well-known sermon that's ever been communicated, and I'm going to admit to you, there is a certain sense of awe and wonder that should, have come up, should have, that should come upon all of us as we approach this most amazing message that the Lord spoke some 2,000 years ago. And just as much, it's worth also noting that just as much as people were interested in not only being touched by Jesus miraculously, if you read the Gospels as a whole, you get the indication that just as much, if not more, people were interested in what he was teaching. Not just 12 disciples, but massive crowds came to hear what he had to say, whether it was on a, on a mountainside or on a lakeside or anywhere in between. People came to hear what he had to say. We know this according to Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and through 29, which is the last part of the Sermon on the Mount. We know that people were amazed at his teaching. People were amazed at his teaching because of the way he taught as an authority figure, not just quoting people from the past, but speaking on his own authority. That blew their mind as well as the reality of what he was saying. And the Sermon on the Mount 
is kind of synopsis of all of his teaching, all kind of put together. That being said, remember, the Sermon on the Mount is about, it's more about kingdom realities than it is about uh, certain expectations. And that's going to be important as we go through it, because if we're not careful, we're going to read it as a list of of to-dos and not-to-dos that, by the way, we'll probably fail at more often than we succeed and end up going, being frustrated and wondering, well, then what, what, what? Don't forget that Jesus was communicating in such a way that a Jewish audience would help, would, would, would understand that the Mosaic law was pointing towards their need for a Savior, and he who was speaking to them was him. Let's keep that in mind, yeah? When he teaches in the sermon, or when Jesus teaches throughout his ministry, don't forget he taught more about eternal life than he did about a better life. Yes and amen? Amen. I don't know about you, but man, uh, yesterday was hot. (laughs) Today's going to be hotter. (laughs) More intense in terms of the temperature. (laughs) And there were some of us who were outside working in the heat. Well, some of us were working more than others. But there were a group of us working in the heat or talking, depending on who you were. And there was a part of me that was like, I just want a better situation right now because it was so hot outside, right? And and there was a part of me that, like, as a good American Christian living in our day and age, that I think to myself, you know what? I know we're serving another ministry, but my goodness, there are other servants out there that are better equipped for this because I deserve better than this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, we know that that's not true, and we know that I most likely thought that, and if that disturbs you, then, like, get over it because you think it too sometimes. And furthermore, it was followed by a smile because I thought, well, how ridiculous is that of me? Jesus is more interested in my eternal reality and internal life than he is my comfortable life, right? He taught more about knowing God than he taught about (laughs) godly knowing. You guys see the subtle difference? Man, he taught about what a relationship with the Almighty was like and the results thereof more than he did about teaching good facts and figures about God. Does that make sense? And as a Christian community, man, we'd be good. It would do us well to remember those distinctives so that we could embrace, even as we make our way through the sermon and the Beatitudes, so that we could embrace all the more our relationship with God, knowing that that's going to produce good things from God through our lives. He taught more about internal transformation than he did about external organization. And I I bring that up as the last little three he taught about, because, you know, as a good pastor, you have to say everything in triplicate. So I bring that up as the last thing because it's important to remember that it would be easy to read the sermon and say, okay, if we do this and we don't do that and we don't do that and we do do this, we're good and just kind of organize our life from the outside in. But as we've made mention of over and over and over for about six years now, Christianity doesn't work from the outside in. It works from the inside out. And if Jesus taught more about internal transformation that makes a difference in your external life, then that's the way we've got to view this thing and understand ultimately what he's doing. He's pointing towards our need for him in our lives. And he's teaching this crowd that gathers together. Even remember as Jesus moves away from the conflict that was going on around him with the religious elitist leaders of the day. And he goes away to the countryside, if you will, and his disciples follow him. And this is what we're told in Matthew chapter 5. And the disciples, just so you know, can mean just the 12, but it can also mean the 12 and so many more. And we tend to believe it's the 12 and so many more. But what's important about that term disciple, it is those who, as they could with the knowledge they had at that point, those who had decided somehow to to lean into this figure named Jesus, who some were calling the Messiah, the Savior, the one they were waiting for. So Jesus, being followed away from the conflict by a substantial crowd, sits down and begins to teach them, and, and, and he teaches them in a way 
that it's important to understand is exactly how we, if you will, they would have been told that the Messiah would teach. Remember, Isaiah, I'll turn there. Just trust me, you can jot it down. Isaiah chapter 61. I love these little ribbons. And post-it notes and whatever else you can use. Isaiah 61, speaking of Jesus, you're going to remember this because he said it in a synagogue before, but it's worth reminding us even as we get into what he's going to teach to who it is that he was talking to. It says, the spirit of the God, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion and to give them a, a, a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit that they may be called oaks, of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. See, some 700 years prior to Christ's arrival to his incarnation, Isaiah spoke that the Messiah would come and do this, right? And it's important to remember, that's exactly what Jesus is doing through this sermon. And he starts, if you will, with this beautiful introduction about the blessings of believing, okay? Okay. Now, I don't know about you, but I've heard this sermon a number of times in my Christian 30-year experience. I've heard it a number of times. I've heard it taught a number of times. And I've heard it taught from usually one specific angle, and that is blessed are. And so I always, you know, easily fall into this, this me, me, me first mentality <laughs> and interpret it in a certain way. In other words, okay, yeah, 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 I'm sure he was talking to someone somewhere at some point, but right now I just want to know what it means for me. And my goodness, as a believer, I want to be blessed. Yes and amen? amen. Okay. And if you're in here and you're like, no, nope, no, nope, I'm not interested in being blessed. I'm a selfless Christian. I mean, come on, look in the mirror and be honest. We all want blessings from God, don't we? Yes, it's okay, right? And so we can read it and go, blessed are, and I go, oh, okay, I gotta be that way. And then blessed are, okay, now I gotta be that way and I gotta make sure. I wanna caution us. Remember, Jesus is teaching in a way that is more interested with our internal transformation than our external organization. If we see this as 12 steps to being blessed in our lives, we're gonna miss the point. I don't know about you, but I've seen it as 12 steps to being more blessed in my Christian experience. And I've been frustrated, not with God, but usually with my own inability to perform in a way that ensures that I'm blessed. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we are going on Wednesday nights on YouTube. We're kind of going through, not kind of, we are going through the book of Job. And one of the issues in the book of Job is the people during that day had a theology that believed that if you lived right, then God blessed you. If you lived wrong, then God cursed you. And it's a very limited and legalistic theology because if we look at all of Scripture, God is much more gracious than that. Like nobody lives right, and yet through his son he chooses for everybody to have the opportunity to have the blessing of eternal life through their faith in him. Yes? There are no one right, none righteous, no, not one, according to Paul in the book of Romans. And so what we have to do is embrace this for the way Jesus was communicating. And he was communicating to a very, very specific crowd. The disciples, as well as a group of people who had, at the best of their ability to that point so far with what they knew, they were making a choice by faith to follow him. Now, that is an important distinction because this was a group of people that were supposed to be following them, not him. Them being the religious establishment in Israel. And these people have said, no, I think there's something to this guy. And they follow him. And they follow him to what is most likely a hillside on the outskirts of the Galilean region, which, by the way, is a beautiful place to have a sermon. However, just so you know, the beauty that we would see on pictures, because I challenge you, man, go home, Google it. Don't do it right now. I know you can, but don't. Go home, 
Google it and look at pictures of like Sermon on the Mount's possible spots and see the Sea of Galilee in the background. And in your mind, you'll be like, oh my word, that would be so beautiful. Yeah, as well as 130 degrees outside. You know what I mean? <laughs> Keep that in mind for next week. <laughs> know this about the Beatitudes, and it's important to get this right away. Jesus is proclaiming to those who were already following him that God's heart was, I'm going to use a made-up phrase, so just go with it. God's heart was blessingly inclined to them even though the theology of their day had convinced them that their lives were too messy and lousy to be blessed by God. Jesus was proclaiming to a group of people whose religious authorities had convinced them at every turn that they were not worthy of God's blessing because they didn't Sabbath right. Because they didn't sacrifice right, they didn't give right, didn't pray right, didn't talk right, didn't dress right, didn't cut their hair right. Those aren't trivial things for the, the, the very, very, for lack of a better term, serious Jewish person in that day. Because of all of those things, this crowd that was following Jesus, which, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and bridge the context a little bit and say it was probably a crowd a lot like this one. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know if you've noticed, but we're here on a Sunday morning in Southern Oregon. We're not at like this, this highfalutin seminary service. We're just everyday, ordinary people, uneducated, educated, everybody in between just doing our best because we believe, wait a minute, I think Jesus is for me. Amen. Yeah? Amen. This is the crowd that Jesus is talking to, a crowd that in their day had been told their lives were too messy and too lousy to be blessed by God because they weren't good enough at keeping the rules and regulations. And Jesus begins to talk to them. He begins to, if you will, look at this. It's beautiful when you see it. It's amazing. He begins to call them out lovingly, not critically. Look at what he says. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and he sat down, which was the normal authoritative way of teaching, which, by the way, I was going to sit down because I just wanted to honor the Lord in that way, but we forgot to put a stool up here, and I didn't know how to go get one without it being awkward. Yeah, but somebody else is going to use that, and if I use that little brown one, then I'm a wee little man on a wee little stool. It's going to look weird. So let's spin this. I'm going to stand up because I don't think I'm as authoritative as Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I'm being humble. Um, he sat down with his disciples and he, and he said to them, he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who are internally brokenhearted with nothing left emotionally or otherwise to offer to anyone, and especially God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, some have interpreted this, and it's okay, as those who understand that they need a Savior. Well, okay, that's fine. But you got to remember this crowd, not just spiritually, but even practically. There was a crowd gathered on that, that mountainside that day. I wish I could say that Sunday, but we don't know what day it was. It'd just be cool. That day, there was a crowd gathered, and there were many whose lives were messy and had left them feeling poor in spirit, like brokenhearted on the inside, maybe because they couldn't ever live up to the expectations, maybe because their sons and daughters weren't living up to the expectations, maybe because they just couldn't, get, who knows what it was, but they were brokenhearted internally and as a result felt as if they had nothing to offer anyone, therefore, and especially God. Therefore, there was no way that they could see themselves as blessed by God. Amen. How many people do we know today, don't know how far we're going to get because we're just going to go, but how many people do we know today that are feeling that same way? 
And it's not just like in church. Church, don't you know that church comes with certain levels of expectation about performance? You say this, you don't say this. Some of those things are really good. Like there's just certain words that we shouldn't use as a practice in our communication because it's just ugly. God wants better for us. Yeah? And then there are others that are just not that great because it's like, wait a minute, there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying that. Like it's just weird tradition. There's certain clothes that we're supposed to wear or not wear. Well, you know, who cares? Like, honestly, here's our rule about outfits here. Just don't be overly distracting because we've come together to put our eyes on the Lord so we shouldn't have our eyes on each other unnecessarily. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Like, there's all kind. Like, they're good in their bad, all of those things. But these people, man, people that we know in the church... But even people on the outside within culture are constantly being reminded that they're not virtuous enough, this enough, that enough, that enough, whatever enough. They're not pretty enough. They're not not pretty enough. We live in a weird time. They're not this enough. They're not that enough. All the while. And people are, listen, all it takes is a little look in the eyes to recognize that people everywhere are brokenhearted. Brokenhearted on the inside, feeling like they've got nothing to offer anyone. So there's no way that God could in any way be blessingly inclined to them. Now, part of why we're going through this is, oh, we've got other news, don't we? We've got something called the gospel, which in those kinds of circumstances and situations, it's good news, isn't it? Because the crowd that Jesus was talking to, some of them would have been like, yeah, that's me. I don't know if they raised their hands in Israel. I don't know if they amen. <laughs> Probably not. But you know that there were some in that crowd when Jesus said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. There were some that were like, yeah. That's me. And I'm holding on by a thread. And I'm hoping against the hope of my culture that God can help me. And Jesus says to them, we can. (laughs) Did you guys notice what I said? I didn't say that Jesus said that he can. He says we can. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying there's a place for you. When you feel brokenhearted and bankrupt, Jesus is saying to that crowd, because your lives don't add up, and you feel like because of that, as a result of that, there's no way you could ever belong to the proper people of Israel in the proper place. Like for them, literally, just so you know, there were certain parts in the, in the temple that they couldn't go to because maybe their lives weren't adding up that week. When you feel marginalized, cast aside and cast away and not valued, know this. God sees you, and he knows you, and the very faith that you're exercising, that you're not even aware that you're exercising by following me out to this place and listening to what I have to say, indicates you're on the right track. You're becoming a kingdom person. This is what Jesus says. This is good news, ladies and gentlemen, for people. The best news that anybody anywhere could ever hear, especially those that are brokenhearted on the inside, feel bankrupt with nothing to add, nothing to offer anyone emotionally, spiritually, or any other way. The best news that they could hear is there is an opinion and a perspective about them that matters more than the world around them. And it's God Almighty who says throughout Scripture all over the place, I love you. I love you. I'm inclined towards you. I have a blessing for you that can be found through my son. I love you. I'm waiting for you. I'm knocking on the door of your heart. Just answer it. We've got the gospel that we can give to people like that. For those that maybe you're here and you don't even want to admit it, you're doing your best to, to like make sure nobody sees that you might be poor in spirit. And you feel guilty about it because, my goodness, I'm a good church-going Christian. I'm not supposed to be poor in spirit. I'm supposed to be rich and wealthy in the gospel. That's what he gets excited about every week. <laughs> but we all know that life is, is tricky. <laughs> and if you're here and you're in that place, just know this. That doesn't mean that God doesn't care about you. And it doesn't mean that God can't bless you. It doesn't mean that he's not happy with you. In fact, Jesus seems to indicate through him that God is blessingly inclined to you. You belong more than you think you do. He moves on, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, those who are hopelessly sad and feel like they are unable to move one more step. 
And when I say those who are this way, just so you know, I'm just kind of doing some, I'm just doing some educational study for us. Like that's what the word in the original language, the word mourn, it means basically those who are hopelessly sad and feel like there's no way that they can take one more step in life. Jesus says to them, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Notice it doesn't say that they'll get better if they get to this place. It says they shall be comforted, which indicates, remember the whole umbrella is God is blessingly inclined towards these people, towards us people, towards these people. Like what it means is this, the blessing is that God will go where you are and meet you there and comfort you. God will go there. Like that's the beauty of this deal. Blessed are those who mourn, that feel hopelessly sad, like they can't even move another step. It says, Jesus says, for they shall be comforted. There's this indication that God is willing to meet them right in the middle of that messy place and bring them a sense of peace and hope to replace hopelessness with hopefulness. He's willing to do that. Now, how's he going to do that? We might be asking. They would have been, how's he going to do that? And I don't know if I would have been Jesus and I'm not and we're all glad. But if I was, I would have been, I'm right here, man woman, child, I got you. I don't know if they said it like that. It's like, honestly, I'm not suggesting that Jesus went around going, I got you. But it would have been through Jesus. It would have been through the scriptures. Jesus got a whole sermon. This, just so you know, for him, this is just the introduction. He's getting their attention. <laughs> and he's going to really talk to him. We're going to take like six weeks to do it, but he did it in a few hours. Just so you know, that, did you, Americans, did you get that? Mm -hmm. He taught this sermon over a few hours. So buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> He's also going to bring comfort to those who are mourning. He's not only going to bring it through like his son. He's going to bring it through his spirit and through his saints. Are you with me? Again, we're reading the book of Job. Job's experienced a loss on levels that we can't even imagine. Sitting on an ash heap with covered in just ridiculously painful sores, so painful he was taking broken pieces of pottery and trying to scrape them away, it hurt so bad externally. Not to mention it was an indication of how his heart felt internally. He was a broken man. And his friends hear about the devastation and the, 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 the tragedy that had taken place. So they come to comfort him. And if you haven't tuned in to the Wednesday night study in the book of Job, you need to. Because we made a point over and over and over. The best comfort that they brought to him was the seven days when they sat with him and said nothing. Things get real weird when they open their mouth. But when the, for seven days, the book of Job says that his friends came and they just sat with him. In his suffering. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes God's going to do that to those who are blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Could it be that maybe even some of us might receive comfort from some of us and the scriptures and the spirit and even the saints? That's us, right? And if you know people that are hurting and you need to come alongside of them, let me just reiterate once again. Sometimes the best thing we can do is just sit in silence and pray. Yeah, man. I am. You don't have to have all the answers. I don't know about you, but sometimes, man, I don't. Listen, little history. I didn't get into pastoral ministry because I wanted to be a pastor. Visiting somebody in the hospital, I'm so afraid of it, I can't say it. It's terrifying. There's so many moments that are terrifying. Get a call have to go sit with a wife as she watches her husband die? I didn't sign up for that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, don't think. I became a youth pastor because I liked hanging out with young people and having a great time. Summer camp's fun. Hiking mountains are great. <laughs> Paddle boarding with kids and getting paid to tell them about Jesus sounds wonderful to me. <laughs> and then you get the call. And then you get the circumstances. And then you get the reality of it. And even when we're terrified, even when we don't feel like we can do it, our presence 
with God's guidance brings plenty of comfort. Let's be there for each other. Let's be there for each other. And by the way, that's not, be gentle and loving. Please hear this so. It's not just the job of the pastors. It should be. Like, we should absolutely do that. But it's the community that has an opportunity to bring comfort to one another. Right? Right? So let's do it. Let's do it. Jesus said, blessed are those who are mourning, for they shall be comforted. By the way, their religious system didn't bring them any comfort. It only made them more uncomfortable because they had to perform so much in the midst of their grief and suffering and struggle. He goes on in verse 5 and he goes, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those meek means those who are gentle of heart towards life. And even though they may not appear to be a mover and shaker. This is a very important nuanced word in their culture. Those who would inherit the earth, so to speak, which is a a way of describing those who are going to do well in this world, in their day and age, was the movers and the shakers, those who took charge, those who were leading, those who were sure, those who were loud, those who were making sure that everybody knew and there was no doubt this person is a significant person. But the crowd was full of people whom those people called insignificant. So what about them? And Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. For they shall be a blessing to the world and the world to them. Blessed are those who, are, who, who maintain a gentleness of heart towards life. Now remember, we've said it before, meekness is not weakness actually the word indicates strength Mm -hmm. given and controlled by God himself right Right? Right. it's so funny in a world that says your influence is based on how many views likes clicks and followers and if that's not your world good but just know that for a majority of the world it is Mm -hmm. it's brutal it's brutal Like our influence isn't based on that. It's not based on how we present. What's, what it's based on is allowing the heart of Jesus to be in us and work it out through us. That will be, bring about a successful life. He goes on in verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who long. Listen, let's hear this. Blessed are those who long for things to be as God has always intended them to be. For they will be satisfied. In other words, God will have his way in this world. Mm -hmm. Here, there, or there, there. Either way, we know the rest of the book, and he will make everything right. And Jesus indicates there's a blessing toward those. It's a minority group of people towards those who see beyond everything else that's going on, beyond religious culture, beyond social culture, and see that, man, things are not as God desires them to be. And Jesus said there's a blessing for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, righteousness, the way that God intends things to be, for they will be satisfied. God will bring it about, and there will be a satisfaction in the soul of each person who is longing for God's ways. And just remember what we long for, because some of us are like, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But what we're longing for is not what we think God's ways should work out in our neighborhood, in our town, in our uh, 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 state or country. God's perspective is even bigger than that who long for the reality that people somehow miraculously by faith will be reconciled to God because of the reality of the sacrifice of his son. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who long for things to be the way God intended them to be. And it's just so you know, it's not just a big overarching longing. It's a day-by-day, moment-by-moment longing. I'm like everybody else. I long for my neighborhood, K 
county, state, and country to be as God intends it to be. Amen? But like many of us, sometimes I get so distracted with those big ideas that I forget about in the moment at the grocery store, in the moment, in my car, in the moment, in the conversation, in the moment at church, in the moment of interaction, I forget God still has an intention, a righteous intention, even in the midst of the little moments, just as much as he does in the big ones. And if I'm only focused on the big ones, quite often I'm missing the middle ones. And I believe without a doubt, that's frustrating. Conversely, if I pay attention in the little ones, guess what happens? A whole bunch of little things add up to a lot of big things. May we be a people, God was explaining to them and to us, may we be a people who long for things to be as God intends them on a macro level and a micro level. In the big picture and in the everyday moment. May we be that people. He continues on. He goes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Now, that's an interesting thing because the merciful means a, a, a person who desires to give grace uh, to undeserving people. That's, that's a value, by the way, that culture, theirs and ours, has never really valued very highly. People get what they deserve and will give if they deserve it. And Jesus is like, he's saying, wait, blessed are the merciful, those who are willing to give the grace that I'm actually showing you and teaching you how to give even to undeserving people because that's God's heart, by the way. That is a reflection of God's character because they're going to receive mercy. Do you see what he does there? Because God's mercifully inclined towards them. There's this reality there. In other words, you could say it this way. Blessed are those who give unto others what God has given to them. Does that make sense? Yes. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but it's lost on me. Sometimes I forget that their presence with, listen, <laughs> like we're just like, oh, it'd be so fun to sit on a side of the hill with Jesus. That'd be so great. Well, yeah, if we understand grace, but if we don't, it would be terrifying because we know enough theology to remember, to realize this is the son of God, God in the flesh, standing among, sitting, among mere mortals whose lives were messy and undeserving of mercy. And I think, oh, I would have loved to be there. Actually, maybe not, because it would have been terrifying. What if God wasn't mercifully inclined to me? We forget that maybe, and I want to say this respectfully, but it's easy to forget that they and us, without Jesus, we deserve the lightning bolt from heaven. I didn't think that would get a clap. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I don't know about you. It's been six or seven years that I've been around here, and not once has a lightning bolt come down from heaven. Like, I mean, in the building, striking someone dead. <laughs> Namely me, just so you know. Hasn't happened once. Why? Because God is merciful towards us. May we never forget that. May we always be grateful for his grace. And a grateful heart for his grace is one that also, come on. Oh, I don't know why I did that. Gives his grace. Because Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If we don't keep going, we're never going to make it. Blessed, verse 8, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are those whose lives have been transformed by the salvation that Jesus offers through his life, death, and resurrection because then there is no wall between them and the Father. And Jesus is doing that. He's saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That reality was working out right then. And remember, the pureness of their heart was not based on their merits. It was based on his grace. Yes? What an amazing thing. He goes on. He says this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who seek to bring people together instead of driving people apart. Can I say it again? Blessed are those who seek through the gospel to bring people together instead of driving people apart. I, I'm, gonna, I'm just, I'm just going to brag a little. Not about myself, but about this church. I have experienced this church as exactly that. 
a church where people are welcome. People can come. People are encouraged to come together instead of dividing apart. Regardless of like skin tone, whether that's like natural brownness <laughs> or added greenness, like regardless of skin tone, regardless of age, regardless of economics, regardless of all of those social things that seek to drive people apart. I've experienced RVCC as a place where God is working among his church to bring people together. May we keep working to that end. This would have been mind-blowing for them. The religious system in that day just kept driving people apart. The temple courts themselves were divided in such a way. Listen, man, if you were a lady, you couldn't go to church with your man. I mean, you could go. You'd just have to go to separate rooms. Is that mind-blowing? I've been to the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, the one that's on TV all the time. There's a place where Gentiles can go, and then there's also a place where ladies go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Praise Jesus that he's come, and he transforms hearts, and he breaks down all of those dividing barriers. Paul speaks of it in Colossians. He speaks of it in Galatians. He says, there's no Jew, there's no Gentile. There's Christ, who is all and is in all, bringing people together. Blessed are people who seek for that. He goes on in verse 10. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for those are the, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are hassled and hated because of their right faith in Jesus. There's, also, there's, there's a blessing there. And don't you know, like, I don't know about you, but in their day and age, they would not, if they hadn't felt it yet, they would really feel it in the coming 18 months as they walk with Jesus because every single person who connected their life with Jesus ended up being hated. In fact, after the church was birthed out of his resurrection. There's an entire generation of believers that were persecuted, many unto death, because of their belief, because of their right faith in Jesus. And God is proclaiming to that audience and us now, there is a blessing there because even though they persecute us, we belong to the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, he says in verse 11, when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account because of Jesus. Just so you know, if people revile you and utter all kinds of terrible things about you because you're a ter terrible person, okay, not you, me. People revile me and utter ter terrible things about me because I'm a terrible person, that's on me, not Jesus. I can't claim, oh my goodness, they're just persecuting me. No, I need somebody, John, I need you to pull me aside and go, no, you're just acting like an idiot. Right. <laughs> you see what I mean? What Jesus is talking about is if you have faith in Jesus and because of that faith in Jesus, people hate you and persecute you, you hold on. God loves you, he says. You hang on. You hang on because you're in the right place. It's interesting. As Jesus gives this sermon out, right, these disciples would have heard it. And here's the interesting thing. I don't know if you've ever connected this, but if you keep reading in Matthew chapter 5, you move from verse 12 right into verse 13, and Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can the saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. The city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. These amazing devotional verses for the Christian community. I love it. Like, we should communicate all the time. You're the salt and light of the world, Right? right? That the people of Jesus are supposed to have not only a preserving, but also an illuminating effect on the world around them. Next week, we're going to talk about how that might work out for us. But listen, a lot of times, I don't know about you, in our devotional mentality towards the word of God, we forget that those verses are directly connected to the Beatitudes. 
And the Beatitudes is this introduction to this most amazing sermon, as we shall see in the weeks to come, where Jesus looked at a crowd that was full of people who were poor in spirit, mourning, cast aside, marginalized. I wrote some things down in the way of describing these people, the audience, people who were marginalized, overwhelmed, gentle, gracious, the, the people who had been in the process of transformation, those who brought people together, true believers, these people that we all look at those things and say, man, those things are great. But in their culture, they were not great. And they were actually reasons why they could not be the salt and the light. And look at what Jesus says. It's important for you to understand that God is blessingly inclined towards you because of your even baby mustard seed type faith in me. And know this. That God's willing to use you, even though everybody around you says that he's only using them. Don't you believe it? He's willing to use you for the most profound purposes that the world has ever known. So let's wrap this up. What's the application? How does this work? Well, be more poor in spirit. <laughs> to be blessed. No, that's not how it works. How it works is if we identify with any group that Jesus described, any individual or groups of individual that feels those way, that are fighting that way, that are trying that way, and yet overwhelmed and feeling marginalized, cast aside, and undervalued, just know this without a doubt. Today's point is that we would be reminded, just like they were then, that God's heart, regardless of our circumstances, because of our faith in him and his grace towards us, is blessingly inclined towards us even in a way that transcends our circumstances. Yes and amen. amen. So if we have a bad day, we get the beauty of, of, of being free from having to say that God is mad at me. We don't have to do that. We can say, wait a minute, even in the midst of a bad day, I'm still viewed by God as blessed. Why? Because of Jesus and because of what he has done. Why don't you stand with me for just one moment? And if you're out there joining us through a live stream, I'm assuming that most everybody is inside today because it is hot out there. How do I know? I'm sweating up here. But as the worship team comes back up, it is worth remembering that the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount that we call the Beatitudes should capture our attention for the rest of what Jesus wants to say. Because he speaks to a crowd that's filled with people that maybe somebody would want, but most don't. It's filled with people that are struggling with real life. Filled with people that are trying to do their best to do God's work and give him glory. Just filled with all kinds of people, even though we may not have a big audience. Jesus speaks to them and us now, and he says, you're blessed by God. And because you're blessed by God, don't you ever forget that you can be used by God to be his salt and his light in a tasteless and dark world. It's not about, listen, it's not about your performance. It's about Jesus and what he has done. It's about his performance. We get this privilege because he lived and died and rose again on the third day that God might be blessingly inclined towards us. Now, I know for some, that's a tough reminder because circumstances are maybe in this last year worse than they've ever been. But his blessing still transcends. It has to because it's his. Yes? I would only ask that we would hold on to it. That being said, if you're having a hard time holding on to that reality, please come and talk to one of the elders. Talk to Pastor Josh. Talk to me. We'd love to just pray with you and sit with you. We'd love to bring comfort to you because... That's what God wants. For the rest of us, man, as we remember his grace in communion today, through the little packets that you either picked up on your way in or you go get in a second, 
Like anytime during this last song, I want to invite you to just open up those packets and eat of the unleavened bread and drink of the little bit of juice as a way of remembering that God is blessingly inclined towards us because of what Jesus has done for us. He has taken our place on a cross and shed his blood for our forgiveness. Maybe you're out there or even in here and you're following Jesus has kind of been at a distance, trying to figure out what this might be all about or what this looks like or how this might work, but you've never actually taken that, that full step like, okay, I'm all in. May today be a challenge inclination of God is found through our relationship with Christ. Maybe today's that day where you recognize, wait, that's a good gospel, man. And I want to encourage you, if you've never done it, just take that step of faith and say, Jesus, I want you to be not only my Lord, my Savior, but, but the one who blesses my life. And you just embrace him by faith. If you're interested in that, come and see Josh, myself, Paul, Lon, any of the leadership team here, or see somebody standing next to you. I guarantee you it's a good, good community that seeks to bring people together. They can help you. We can help each other. Take that step for the rest of us. Let's remember, we don't have to worry about who we're not in order to do what God wants us to do. Because the point is not who we're not, the point of his, who he is. And Jesus has taken it taking it all on his own shoulders and taking care of it all that we might actually live as salt and light in the world around us. And I can't wait for next week to unpack that. So Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. Be glorified as we remember you through communion during this song. And be honored as we sing the song and as we pray the prayers and especially as we live our lives. It's in your name that we pray and for your glory that we live. Amen.
Isn't that amazing that the path to blessing is not just making sure you get yours now or making sure your voice gets heard, but it's daily walking close to our Lord. And that's a good message for us today. I'll just let you grab a seat real quickly as I tell you a couple announcements. The first of which is we're having a young adult's barbecue this Friday at 6.30 p.m. Again, that's a young adult's barbecue this Friday. Uh, you can talk to me, Pastor Josh, for more information. And then this upcoming Sunday is July 4th. And whenever we can, we like to have a combined service uh, just because we love unity and we love being together. And so this Sunday, July 4th, we're actually going to do one service at 10 a.m. So this is important. If you show up at 9, you can join us for rehearsal. If you show up at 1045, you can join us for wrap-up. But if you get here at 10, uh, you can be here for the service. So we're excited next Sunday, July 4th. We're all going to be gathering for one service at 10 a.m. So we'll try to get the communication out there so we don't forget, because we will probably forget. Uh, and then lastly, I actually want to show you some slides, because yesterday we got to partner with Helping Hands International in one day of a two-week construction project to make an after-school ministry center right up here at Washington Elementary on South P Street. And there's some amazing gospel ministry uh, going on to kids. And so let's just take a look at these pictures if we can and just celebrate what the Lord did yesterday. That's right. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who served. And I'll just say, you know, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 says that God has called us to the ministry of reconciliation. And so bringing reconciliation in our relationships, in our heart with God, and in our community. So it was a joy to serve with you guys yesterday and be a part of blessing our neighborhood. With that, we say, go as people who are blessed in the name of Jesus.